Hello and happy Thursday, everyone. Casey is away on vacation for a little bit, so it's just me today. I am going to be reviewing some of the things that create autoimmune disease and arthritis, and I'm also going to get into the details of what we can actually do about it. So we're going to do a quick recap of what we chatted about on Tuesday, and then I'm going to be going into the details of all the things that we can do to heal our autoimmune disease and arthritis naturally and holistically. So before we get started, though, for those of you who aren't familiar with who I am, my name is Jessica Melnick. I am a registered holistic nutritionist, the founder of the anti-arthritis method, and I help both men, women and men with various forms of arthritis get back to living life the way they choose to, not the way that they have to. So today, like I said, we're going to review a little bit about what we talked about on Tuesday. So Tuesday, we talked a lot about some of the different various factors that actually can contribute and create autoimmunity and arthritis over time. So of course, it's not something that develops overnight, even though for some of us, like myself, um, we experience symptoms overnight. Um, but these problems and these conditions develop over time for various reasons. So some of these reasons are psychosocial, which we talked about, um, like I said, on Tuesday. So things like having toxic relationships, maybe a really unstable home life growing up, um, maybe being bullied in school or having uh, troubles with learning in general, having um, a job with a really toxic environment or a boss that we really don't like, or just work that we um, really, really don't enjoy. There's also, also things that we need to acknowledge like systemic racism and oppression. These are all factors that can contribute to developing an autoimmune condition or arthritis over the course of many years and decades. There's also movement. So not having enough physical exercise, being sedentary, that is really, really hard on us. And um, there's some studies that say that it's as bad as smoking to sit most of the day. So uh, not having enough physical movement uh, on a day-to-day -day basis can really contribute. Also trauma. So that kind of ties into the whole psychosocial aspect. And trauma can be anything from deeply disturbing or distressing experiences, um, things as serious as, let's say, um, you know, a serious car accident, um, being abused or assaulted, and even smaller things. It has more to do with how it affects you as a person than the quote unquote, severity of that trauma. Uh, we also talked about diet and our nutrition, the quality of our air, the quality of our water. Uh, we're going to be talking about um, some of those things that we can actually do to improve those so that we don't have as much of those um, negative effects from the diet that we're eating, um, the air that we're breathing, the water that we're drinking. We're going to talk about some of the things that we can do to actually improve the quality of that. And we also talked about xenobiotics, microorganisms, and radiation. So things like overexposure and cumulative exposure to chemicals, pollution, radiation, fungus or mold, bacteria, viruses, um, things like power plants, electrical magnetic uh, frequencies, like from our cell phones, our computers, uh, 5G, electrical, electrical cords, and Wi-Fi. So exposure to these things is harmful and has cumulative effects over time. So like I said, Tuesday's topic is a lot of doom and gloom, um, you know, kind of depressing to talk about some of those things that can contribute to arthritis and autoimmunity. So today we're going to get into the details of what we can actually do about it. So sleep and relaxation, I'm sure this is not something that is new to you guys. And this is the time that our body really needs to recover and heal. And the lack of sleep causes an increase in appetite, increased stress and irritability, 
It also lowers the functioning of our immune system and it can actually lead to making poor decisions and having a poor mood in general. So I don't know about you guys, but if I'm sleep deprived, I'm craving more things like junk food, sugary things, salty things, refined carbohydrates that I should not be eating that are going to make me feel crappy. I'm going to have more of an appetite. And also if I'm tired, I'm also going to be less likely to make more uh, positive choices when it comes to uh, eating. So that's just one example of how sleep can really affect us. And when we look at relaxation, it's very, very important. It's self-care it lets our body actually go into the parasympathetic nervous system so that we can go into what is called the rest and digest. So this affects our cortisol levels and that actually reduces them when we are relaxed. So cortisol is a hormone that is produced in response to stress. So whether that is something like doing, um, you know, being stressed out at work or having stress at home, Cortisol increases when that happens. And if we are chronically stressed over time, we have chronically elevated cortisol. Cortisol has a lot of really negative effects on the body if it remains elevated over time. So that's another really important reason why we need to learn how to relax our body and go into that parasympathetic nervous system so that we can reduce that cortisol level. And when we have a lower cortisol level, that actually helps us sleep better and reduces our stress. So if we were to have a stressful event uh, shortly before bed, or if we were to like exercise too close to bed, then our cortisol levels are going to be up. It's going to be a lot harder to sleep. And how can we actually improve our ability to relax? So that's a great question. And I always tell my clients that we have to make this a priority. You have to make it an appointment and you have to put it in your calendar. Otherwise, I know a lot of you busy people out there, you're going to put it on the back burner and you're going to be doing everything else but and or leaving it to the last minute and only if you have time left in your day. So not making it a priority. So it's really, really important to make your own uh, fun and relaxation a priority and putting it into your calendar. It's just as important as your kids' activities, your grandkids' activities, your work, uh, looking after another family member, etc. It's just as important as all of those things. So please mark it in your calendar, even if it's just starting for five minutes a day. And some fun examples of ways to relax. So I'm not talking about meditation unless that's something that you really like to do. I personally don't enjoy meditation, but I really do enjoy yoga. It forces me to breathe deeply, which calms me down, allows me to enter that parasympathetic nervous system. And it's also a really nice, gentle way that I can get some exercise and movement as well. So Think about in terms of having fun and relaxation, I want you guys to think about what actually makes you happy. What makes you laugh? What's something that you look forward to? And like I said, it can be five minutes a day, just just something, just taking some time for you. So if you have to go into the bathroom and shut the door and set the timer on your phone for five minutes, just so you can be alone, then start there. You know, if that's something that you need to do just to chill out. Now, let's talk about how we can improve our sleep, because um, I know a lot of people, especially if we are busy and we have stress in our lives, it can be hard to sleep. There are some tweaks that we can make that will allow us to have better sleep, so falling asleep easier and staying asleep. So we want to make sure we have good sleep hygiene. And what does that mean? That means make sure that your bedroom is dark Get some blackout blinds if you must, Um, if you're somebody that can't fall asleep, if there's light outside. Also, depending on where you live too, if you live in a city, there's going to be a lot of street lights. That light is also going to make it harder for you to fall asleep and stay asleep. So you want to make sure your room is dark. Um, you want to make sure that your vice, your devices are turned off or and they're not like directly next to your head on the bed because you're going to be having frequencies emitting from that that are going to interfere with your sleep. 
So we also recommend that you make sure that you're not in front of a TV screen, a computer screen, or your tablet or your phone an hour before bed, because that's very stimulating. That blue light from those devices is very stimulating. And it's also just if you're like working still or you're doing something that's just, you know, maybe watching a show, it's very stimulating. So you want to make sure you're away from screens for about an hour before bed. If you are in front of screens, get yourself some blue blocking glasses. You don't know what I'm talking about. Please Google them. There are lots of different variations of them out there. I have some reading glasses that have blue blocking uh, lenses. And so if I'm watching TV before bed, I make sure I have my glasses on so it filters out that blue light, which is really stimulating. That can really make it hard for you to fall asleep and stay asleep. Um, also, make sure that you have the right temperature. You don't want to have a room that's too cold or too hot. If it's too warm, it's going to be really hard for you to comfortably sleep as well. Um, also, don't eat or exercise within a few hours before bed. Exercise is really stimulating if you do it too close to bed. So unless you're doing some gentle yoga stretches, I don't recommend getting your heart pumping because it's going to be increase that those cortisol stress hormones and it's going to be harder for your body to go into that parasympathetic rest state. Also caffeine. Um, everyone has varying degrees of caffeine sensitivity. So you're going to want to make sure that you're not drinking caffeine well into the afternoon. I know for me, if I have anything with caffeine in it after like three o'clock, then I'm in trouble. I'm not going to be able to sleep very well. And if I was to ever have a cup of coffee after dinner, oh my goodness, like I won't sleep at all that night. Um, everyone's a little bit different, but if you're having trouble sleeping, make sure that you're cutting caffeine out, preferably by noon and see how that does for you. Also alcohol. Alcohol is one of those things that can really relax you and make you feel sleepy, but it is also one of those things that will stimulate you in the middle of the night. So it may help you fall asleep, but it's also going to wake you up in the middle of the night. And uh, so it's really going to interfere with your sleep. And I've, I've noticed that with myself, especially the older I get, um, really, really notice how that makes me feel. So those are just some things that I want you to be aware of so that you're able to sleep deeper, which is going to help you reduce your stress overall. Now let's look at exercise and movement. So when you have arthritis or an autoimmune condition, you really need to find the correct balance for you. Um, you're going to want to be able to do movement from where you're at and based on what your current abilities are physically. So you're not going to want to do things that hurt. Um, you're going to want to do things at your current physical ability, depending on if you have a flare up, um, whatever is going on for you. So start with maybe some gentle stretches if you're currently in the middle of a flare up or if you can go for a walk, you know, do that. So anything that's like low impact, if you are currently dealing with a flare up and you have inflammation in your body, you're going to want to start gentle and slow. So you're going to really focus on movements that feel good to you and eventually move into some light resistance training. So using some light weights, because what that's why that's really important is that is going to help you build and maintain your muscle mass. And that is especially important as we age, because having muscle wasting as we get older can lead to some chronic health conditions. So we really want to maintain strength. And, and even if you can, you can still build strength as you get older, too, if, if resistance training is new to you. So you want to find that sweet spot. So, for example, I used to go to the gym and do a 45 minute to an hour of weight training. And what I found out was that it was way too intense for me. It was way too much. And I needed to have a nap after that. And I felt tired for the rest of the day. So instead of energizing me like exercise should and make you feel really refreshed, um, you should like a little bit of soreness is fine, but you don't want to feel like you need to sleep the rest of the day. So I have to really scale it back. And now I realize my 25 to like 35 minute at home workouts are much more suitable for me. They leave me feeling really good, clear headed, refreshed, energized. And I don't feel like I need to drink a pot of coffee just to make it through the day. So you need to find that sweet spot. 
And I also say too, you know, let go of expectations of what you think you should be able to do physically. You know, our bodies are always changing. They change over time and they change with the condition that we're dealing with. So what we used to be able to do is not going to be realistic for us now. So we're not 25 anymore and that's perfectly fine. We need to work with our body where it's at. And just because you're getting older doesn't mean that you can't um, still build strength and stamina. Now, nutrition, of course, because I am a registered holistic nutritionist, nutrition is a huge cornerstone of the work that I do. And um, in my program, we use a very specific nutrition protocol that is made for people with autoimmunity and also for people with arthritis. And it starts off with an elimination diet and it cuts out any and all foods that are scientifically proven to be inflammatory or potentially inflammatory for people with arthritis and autoimmune disease. So then after a minimum of 30 days and, or longer, depending on um, when your symptoms are gone or you feel significantly better, you're going to start gradually reintroducing foods to develop the most comprehensive diet that's going to continue to support your health and keep your symptoms away for the long term. Now, with the elimination diet, we do take out a fairly comprehensive list of foods so that we can allow our body to rest and heal from the continued inflammation that it has been dealing with day in and day out. But like I said, this is temporary and you are going to have tons of support to help you get through this process and work through this process because the whole point is not to have a really strict diet for any length of time for the rest of your life. It is to find the most comprehensive list of foods that is going to support your health for the long run. Okay. And you also, through this process, you're going to get really clear on which foods are really creating inflammation for you and uh, making your symptoms of your arthritis or your autoimmune condition worse. And this is really, really important because there's a huge difference between a food sensitivity and a food allergy. A food allergy has an immediate reaction. So anything as serious as anaphylaxis to hives, um, you know, having a runny nose or itchy eyes, things that are really obvious and that happen really quickly. Um, but a food sensitivity often has a delayed reaction. So you can be intolerant to a food and not have a reaction for up to five days later. And so this process that we work you through in the program helps you get really, really clear through the elimination process and the gradual reintroductions, which foods work for you now and which ones don't. And you need to remove those foods that are causing that inflammation and that sensitivity so that you're able to do some internal healing work so that you can get rid of your symptoms. So if that sounds a little out there, um, please let me know, uh, send me an email or a comment under this post so that I can give you more information. You can maybe check out the replay of my masterclass. I do host those usually about once a month to really give you guys an understanding of why we do what we do and how that works scientifically to reduce your arthritis and autoimmune symptoms. So now let's look at stress. So we all have stress. Um, you know, stress isn't all negative. If we didn't have stress, we wouldn't be able to get anything done. We wouldn't accomplish anything. So we need to have some stress in our lives in order to do what we need to do, right? But there's a really um, important balance that we need to find. So we have to have stress to get things done, but we also have to learn how to um, chill out and to allow our body to rest. So I've talked about the importance of relaxation and fun earlier in this talk. And the other part of it is that, you know, we really need to look at our thought patterns and our reasons of why we don't take the time to care for ourselves and do the things that we know will help us bring our stress down. So things like cultural expectations, personal expectations of ourselves maybe having a lack of boundaries with some of the people in our lives. So an example of that would be taking care of everybody else first. It doesn't actually make us a better person, but it often leads to us becoming more resentful and an unhealthier version of ourselves. So 
If that's happening, we really need to look at changing the expectations we have of ourselves. Um, and if we do feel like we have pressure from society or our culture in general, that is, that is being put on us. We need to really look at that and identify that. So faulty ways to reduce stress are things that actually harm our bodies and make the next day worse. So I know a lot of people turn to wine. Um, I am guilty of that myself. Uh, staying up too late to watch TV or movies, uh, comfort eating. So these are all things that give us a false sense of relaxation, but actually make us feel worse the next day and contribute to more compounding stress the next day. So we really need to look at what are the things that we really love to do and look forward to do, to doing besides those things that are just going to make us feel worse the next day. And if you don't know, I just say, you know, close your eyes for a few minutes and just take a couple minutes to think about what did you really enjoy doing when you were a kid? And start from there because I feel like when we're kids, we have a lot less inhibitions and we're really drawn to certain things. We're very creative and we like to try new things and we kind of lose some of that spontaneity and that creativity as we get older sometimes. So we need to really think, you know, what do I really look forward to doing? What do I really enjoy and like I said before, if we can only fit five or 10 minutes of that into our day, that's okay. We just need to start somewhere and every little bit counts. And lastly, one other super crucial thing that we need to look at in terms of healing from arthritis or an autoimmune condition is looking at our relationships and the health of our relationships. So it's really important that we surround ourselves with healthy, supportive and positive people. So people who are going to be our cheerleaders, people who are going to support us with our health goals. And I just want you to think about how do you feel after you've been around certain people? Do some people really drain you or do they energize you? Who can support you to reach your health goals? Maybe you need a professional to support you and maybe a community of other people who have the same things that they're dealing with that are wanting to better themselves and that are wanting to heal themselves from their conditions as well. So for example, your spouse may be super supportive, but they might not be um, the type of support that you need in order to reach your health goals and follow through with the plan to address your autoimmunity or your arthritis. So um, that is one of the reasons why I created the program that I've created is because back when I was learning how to get rid of my arthritis symptoms and manage that, I didn't have anybody in like my corner. I, of course, I had amazing family and friends who I love dearly, who were very supportive and wanted the best for me, but it's really hard for them to understand completely if they're not experiencing the same thing and maybe they're not reaching for those same goals either. So I really missed out on having a group of people who could really relate to me to support me through this. And um, I did find having professional support and guidance was also really helpful as well, um, especially in terms of creating a plan of what to do and giving me some accountability to stay on track. So those are some really key things in order to help you reach your health goals, um, you know, regardless of where you're starting from. And um, I hope that gives you guys some food for thought. I hope it gives you some encouragement and um, some hope because there's so much that we have in, in our control. There's so many things that we can do to start addressing our arthritis and our autoimmune symptoms. So let me know in the comments below if this was helpful or if you have any other questions and I would be very helpful to respond. And I will be back on Tuesday with a new topic as well. So I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we will see you again soon. Take care, guys.